in Proverbs chapter 6, there is a series of warnings in this chapter as we kind of work our way through here. And we're going to be looking at them as we're continuing. And chapters 5, 6, and 7 uh, still have the theme of the peril of adultery in it. And each chapter touches on the topic of adultery. In the context of chapter 5, it's beware of, a, or the peril, excuse me, of adultery. In chapter 6, it's beware of adultery. And in chapter 7, it is the crafty harlot. And this is what we call parental, parental instruction. It's, it's, it's didactic in nature, meaning that it's uh, instruction given. And so in chapter 6, we're following that same type of a message and theme here in regards. But there's a couple of breakdowns on certain topics. And the first that is addressed is the dangerous promise or the dangerous promises. And once again here, the... Proverbs starts with this instruction from Solomon to his son, saying, My son. And remember that this parental instruction is very important because children are to heed the wise counsel of their parents. They're to heed the counsel of their parents, or at least those that, that are leading and directing them. And that's what we're to do. We're to receive wise counsel. But he goes on to say, my son, if you become surety, now the, the term or the idea behind this word surety has to do with a guarantee or collateral. If you become surety for your friend, if you have shaken hands in pledge for a stranger. Now, notice that the warning here is, in a sense, to be poverty free. Uh, the picture here is one can live in a way in which uh, they're not in poverty. And it's not talking about riches. It's just talking about wisdom and how one conducts his affairs financially. And I think that there's a lot in the Bible that speaks about stewardship. It speaks about uh, using finances wisely and being a good steward with your resources. And, um, you know, oftentimes um, this is a problem and it can lead to many other problems in uh, relationships and with people. Uh, money is funny and change is strange. And, uh, you know, so <laughs> today the change joke doesn't work because they're not even using that no more. But anyways, you know, this whole idea of relationship based upon money. And, and really the idea here is, is, you know, sometimes people get with this idea, well, you know, the money is evil. Well, the, the love of money is evil. That's what it is. It's the root of all kinds of evil, the love of it, to obsess with it, to, to do whatever needs to be done in order to get it, even if it means harming others and or at the cost of others. But resources ultimately are needed, right? But, but the warning here and the wisdom given here has to do with those who become a guarantee for someone else's debt. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 13, and Paul is writing this letter here. This, this is the word that he says in verse 8. He says, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another has fulfilled the law. Notice that. Owe no man no debt except the debt of love. And the picture here would be that there would be somewhat of security and safety if you are careful. So this idea of this type of transaction would be, in other words, some people have asked the question, you know, is it okay to co-sign for someone? Is it okay to take out a loan for someone? I would say here that, that what the word here surety means or a guarantee means is that really this has to do with you saying, if they don't pay, I will. And the idea more is putting yourself in that position. Are you able? Is it wise? for you to go and really be the surety of, of your friend's debts? Do you even have the means or the ability to be able to take this on? And would it be wise for you to take this on? Because in a sense, if it falls upon you, you become responsible for it. So I would say this. Now, I have come alongside some and co-signed and helped them out. And I don't look at this passage as something that uh, you know, 
that it speaks against. The point is that um, really you're bound to that. And it is a binding contract. <laughs> and, and ultimately, we're going to see a little bit later, the only thing that we should be bound to or there being a binding contract in is the word of God. That's what verse 21 of chapter 6 says. Bind them continually soon, or excuse me, bind them continually upon your heart. Speaking about the word of God. But this whole picture here is not so much to um, creating a loan and or being part of surety for the purpose of gaining interest. Now, there were laws specifically regarding um, you to go ahead and borrow or lend, rather, without interest. Now, th this was something that was practiced among uh, the people of Israel, Exodus 22 and verse 25 and Leviticus chapter uh, 25 and verses 35 and 37. But, but all of this to say that, that the picture here is to be the guarantee of someone else's debt. Now, we often say this because the greatest picture of that, really that position in that title is for one, and that is Jesus himself. He paid a debt he didn't owe, and you owed a debt you couldn't pay. And Jesus took care of that. He became our surety. He became our guarantee. Jesus' body became the collateral for a debt you owed and you couldn't pay. In the context here of, of Proverbs chapter 6, he's saying, if you have shaken hands in pledge for a stranger... now. Some would say that stranger would be foreigner here. And this is the idea. You, you, don't, you don't know anybody until you really know somebody. And even the ones that you think you know, something happens and you realize, I didn't even know them at all. So it's better to perhaps maybe not be the guarantee of someone else's debt. But the wisdom here is really be careful because this could have lasting effects. He's not saying, I forbid you to do it. He's saying, if you become surety, if, because it's a choice that you will make. If it does happen, this was, and this was common in, in, in this time in practices because there's a bunch of laws given to those that, uh, you know, owe you. And remember, every seventh year was the year of Jubilee. The slaves would go free. And so this whole thing of surety and debt and being owed in the Old Testament was a common practice. And it's not that God is like, hey, go ahead, man, take a loan and get him for all the interest you can get. It was already a practice. And what God is doing, rather than condoning it, he's regulating it. Because any time it comes to money and what's owed, as I said before, things get a little rough. But he goes on to say here, and here's why. Because if you speak a word, Jesus says, let your yes be a yes and your no a no. If you are... Look at what he says. If you are, and that is the case, if you do do this, you are snared by the words of your mouth. In other words, your word should be trustworthy enough and valid enough for those to say, I trust you at your word and you will keep your end of the deal. If you're, you're snared by the words of your mouth, you are taken by the words of your mouth. Now, remember that, that words... Uh, you know, had great meaning. As a matter of fact, the word for words, uh, the Hebrew word is debar, which, which means uh, something of substance and weight. Uh, a person's words were that which had weight to it. Uh, one was trusted by the words that he spoke. So the idea behind here is this verbal agreement in that. And I would say, you know, people ask me, you know, hey, what do you think I should do? You know, there's you know, children of mine and or relative of mine, and they want to get this, I just tell them, look, listen, you just need to pray. I'm not going to tell you what to do or what not to do at the end of the day. And, uh, you know, because the last thing I need is you coming to me and saying, well, you're the pastor. You told me to do it. I'm good on that. So <laughs> let's not have no loan conversations, okay? But, but here's the point. You're snared by the words of your mouth meaning that your words become the contract and the means by which this transaction is trusted. Now, if your word is not trustworthy, if your word is not a word that can be trusted, then obviously it would be 
up to the person who is giving this loan or this agreement. It's giving them the opportunity to either choose to do business with you or not. So the word that one is supposed to have, the word that one is supposed to share, Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 5 in verse 37. He says, but let your yes be yes and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. So if your yes isn't a yes and your no is not a no, and Jesus is saying anything contrary to that shows you're not trustworthy you're a liar and uh, don't, in other words, don't make commitments you can't keep because things of that nature, Jesus said it here, uh, whatever is more than these is from the evil one. In other words, Jesus is saying this is inconsistent with the Christian life, so to speak. Remember that this is one of the great sermons that Jesus preached here, starting in Matthew chapter five through chapter seven. But when it comes to the proverb, It's the same idea. You're snared by the words of your mouth. And this doesn't just go with being the surety or the guarantee. This is commitments you make to someone, pledges you make to one another. The Bible says it's better for you to vow, or excuse me, better for you not to vow than to vow and not keep it. Because there's consequences for that. And oftentimes people think that they're the bearer of the vow when the Bible is very clear. You're snared by the words of your mouth. If you make a commitment, To someone or some people, um, the bigger part of all of this is for us pastors, and I'm sure Pastor Simon here would agree that oftentimes many commitments are made to pastors and church leaders when people come to the church. Well, I'll do this and 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 I'll be here and I'll be, listen, they don't understand. They're snared by the words of their mouth. Uh, These are commitments made. They're, They're real commitments. Why? Because the church is alive. It's living. It's not some social club. It's, it's the body of Christ. And, and the Bible says when the body of Christ comes together, well, there is unity among the body. Anything apart from that, Jesus says, hey, if it's different than what is said, then it's of the evil one. People don't realize they're being evil when they're making commitments they know deep down inside they're not going to keep. Now, that's not the way the Lord operates. So this morning, we kind of jumped in a little bit of Proverbs chapter 6, and we'll still go over those verses, but, but we're going to talk a little bit why Jesus says anything other than that is of the evil one. And then we're also going to see here in chapter 6 why God hates certain things. And so he goes on to say here, you're snared by the words of your mouth. You were taken by the words of your mouth. In other words, you're held to this. And so he says here to to flee poverty, so to speak. Don't make yourself a guarantee for another man's debt. Your word has value. He says in verse 3, do this, my son, and deliver yourself. So as quickly as you possibly can get out of this, you better get out of it. Free yourself as quickly as possible. For you have come into the hand of your friend Go and humble yourself. Boy, he's saying here, free yourself as quickly as you can. And then he says, deliver yourself from it. Now, you know, this is a very difficult thing because then you're the one sought after, right? You know, I, I, um, I worked for a college for about nine years and was a part of financial aid in the college and going over you know, this, the tuition and the financial aid, and I'm sitting with many families. And in front of me is a student who just has a desire to be in college. But there's tuition. And the tuition was pretty up there. So, but not as expensive as other schools, I can guarantee you that. Um, But I'm not trying to promote this school or anything like that. I'm just saying it was very good, good price, but still a lot of money. And any time it came down to the student having to take out student loans. Now, mind you, this is a Christian college whose main objective is to graduate with little to zero debt. But there were those times that, you know, the parents made, you know, outrageous amount of money, not the kid's fault. And the kid could not in any way get anything, nothing. 
And so the time came that, okay, we'd sit down, we'd discuss the loan. I just, it would blow my mind. I mean, I wasn't thinking Proverbs 6 at all. I mean, this is your kid. You're not thinking this like, you know, this is my enemy. No, this is your kid, you know, or you're not your neighbor or whatever the case might be. And then the parents would be like, we're not co-signing for you. You, you go, to the, go to the JC, go to the other college where the tuition is like two, three hundred dollars less. A unit. And, and then I was blown away because you see the, the sad look on the child's face because they wanted so bad to be in this school. And uh, I didn't know what to say. I mean, I'm not the one that's in charge. Their parents are, you know. And I'd say, well, you know, if, if, if you can't, if you can't co-sign on this, then, then they can't get the loan and they can't come here, unless you're willing to pay out of pocket. Well, we can't pay out of pocket. So. But I'll never forget one day a father was speaking to his daughter in, in this, and she was just so upset. And I've shared this before here. This is years ago. And, and I remember the dad felt so bad. It's like he couldn't see his daughter cry. I was like, oh, boy, you got you one of those ones. She got you wrapped around her finger. <laughs> And a good Christian family, you know, and he's looking at me like, you know, help me here. You know, so I'm like, Let, let's pray. Let's just all pray. So, so, so we prayed in this, in this office, my office, you know, and I'm just thinking like, Lord, help this young woman. Help this family. And I'll never forget the dad looks at her and he says, you know what? It's not that I don't want you to come here. And it's not that I don't want you to be happy. He just says, I don't want to put myself in place of your dead. You are a young woman. And he says, some young man is going to ask for your hand in marriage. And he's going to be responsible for this. So there's two things we can do. Either you wait till you get married and put this debt on this guy. Boy, I got a kick out of that. <laughs> And her and her dad had an amazing relationship, and she just started laughing with tears. You know how they do it. <laughs> he says, or I'm just going to have to give my word and take care of this for you, because this is what Proverbs 6 says. And she looked at her dad before he could even finish saying, she says, Dad, you've always had a good word, and you've always kept your promises. You're an amazing dad. And then I started. <laughs> no, I didn't. What I did was I just slid the paper over to him like. <laughs> and he says, you really feel that? She goes, I know that. She says, and the Lord will take care of it, Dad. And he says, okay. We're going to take a step of faith and we're going to we're going to do this and we're going to believe the Lord that he's going to take care of it. And, uh, and I'll never forget. He goes, but I just want to read it to you. And he said this to her. If you become surety for your friend and you've shaken hands and pledge for a stranger, you are snared by the words of your mouth. You are taken by the words of your mouth. And he says to her, he says, this is going to be something we got to do together as a family. And I love what her response was. Hasn't it always been that, Dad? Hasn't it always been teamwork? I just thought that was great, man. So, you know, he then took out this outrageous loan. But anyways, I think she even got a car out of the deal. I don't know. It was really good. It was a sweet deal, man. You know, so anyways, here's what was mind-blowing. She started her first semester really excited about the school and so blessed. I mean, straight-A student. After her first semester, I'll never forget this. After her first semester, she came to me and she says, you know what, uh, Pastor David, she says, um, you know, when me and my dad, we prayed, we went home and, and my dad told me that he apologized to me for, for even second guessing, right? She says, and we prayed again. And all I said was, Lord, you know the faith of my dad and you know how much he loves you and just help us that we can, you know, get this all paid and so on and so forth. Boy. She said after her first semester, they got a check in the mail for the entire two years of tuition for that school. 
And, you know, was, I don't know, some relative or this and that. I'm, sure, I'm like, you sure you're not, I'm not on that wheel? Like David Zamora is like, <laughs> my last name starts with the Z. I might be at the end of the list, you know, I always am, you know. And this was this like inheritance thing that came through. And it was for the dad because of a relative or whatever. And he said, here's, here's your tuition. And I says, what did you tell your dad? She goes, I told him what verse two says. You're snared by the words of your mouth. You're taken by the words of your mouth. You spoke these words and said, we will take care of this as a family. And sure enough, the money came in to take care of it. I thought, wow, that was awesome. That was awesome. But you know, here the whole point is, yes, we trust the Lord because he's the one that takes care of these things. But use wisdom as you take these steps in doing these things. Oh, no, man, no debt except the debt of love. And he says, and if anyway, you find yourself in a difficult situation where you become the guarantee of someone else's debt, he's saying, use wisdom and listen, if this is going to come back to you, free yourself as quickly as you can. Deliver yourself from it. Give no sleep to your eyes nor slumber to your eyelids. Deliver yourself like a gazelle. I, I think of Nacho Libre every time I see the word gazelle. <laughs> Deliver yourself like a gazelle. <laughs> I just hear the words of Nacho. You're fast like a gazelle. You know? <laughs> Sorry, guys. That's my favorite movie, okay? <laughs> Deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter. And listen to this. And like a bird from the hand of the fowler. And so what he's saying is, if you become this guarantee, if things go south, know that you're responsible for this debt. And if any way that you can get yourself out of this debt by still keeping a good word, right? What is he saying? Then do so. In other words, he's saying that wisdom would be to be an example in the area of being careful of putting yourself in debt, someone else's debt, but also being very careful to make good on the word that you're snared by in regards to this debt. As the word hooks you and binds you to this debt, be careful. And he says that if all possible, however, he says, give no sleep to your eyes, nor slumber to your eyelids. Think about that. He's saying, think of ways, ponder this very thing. Don't just treat it as, well, it is what it is, whatever. And if they mess on it, but they mess up on it, you know, because some people really treat debt that way. They just treat it however. Deliver yourself. Like the gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like the bird from the hand of the feller. Now in verse 6, he goes on to say, in the same way, this is what I think is interesting, because he's kind of giving on the same topic of, you know, don't put yourself in debt to where you become a slave to someone else. I mean, really, in Old Testament teaching, if you, if you were indebted to someone, well, you became their servant until your debt was paid. So in... In the context of scripture, yes, it can enslave you. It can weigh you down. It can bear you down because that's what debt can do. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no captain, overseer, uh, overseer or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will you slumber, O sluggard? So here you have one. That he's saying, be careful that you don't become a guarantee to someone where you will put yourself in a difficult situation uh, to be bound to this debt and also enslave yourself. But then he also says here, the lazy, well, there's a reason why they are poor. Because they're lazy. It was Paul who said, if you don't work, you don't eat. Go to the ant. The ant was an example. Notice when you look at this, nobody likes ants, right? And um, especially in the summertime when they start coming into the house. I don't know how ants know you got AC, but they do. <laughs> they don't want to be outside. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Some of you are like, really? Wow. <laughs> Pretty smart. <laughs> but here's, here's what he's saying. Look at the ant. Follow the example of them. And, and really think about it. This is what I've done. You know, some people say, oh, there's ants, you know, and they just start getting the whatever. 
to spray, the ant spray, get the ant spray. And they start spraying them. But you know what I do is I follow them. I says, where are they coming from? Because you got to hit the colony. If you just take out the ants, I mean, you don't really have to do much. I mean, you could mess with them, get a piece of chalk and put a line right there. You break up their whole flow. I mean, literally, because the scent is gone. They go by scent. But they're very driven. But if you go to the colony and then you, you know, destroy that, then you won't have ants for a long time. That's just a little food for thought there, okay? So you could pay me later for that. <laughs> but notice how ants are. I mean, they are industrious. They are diligent. They plan ahead. They store. They put away. And this is what their life consists of. And he's saying, go to the ant, you sluggard, you lazy person. Don't be lazy. Consider her ways and be wise. In other words, you can be industrious, diligent, and planning. Be wise. Which having no captain or overseer or ruler provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. This is how they survive. These were... Ants created by God. And the Lord is saying, look at them as an example to see what it is to be able to survive. Well, well laziness, clearly, uh, one who slumbers and, 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 and one who is a sluggard and one who is lazy, obviously, will never get nowhere. You know, the Bible is very clear that laziness is something that God despises. And the reality is, we can also... Not only be lazy physically, but lazy spiritually. If one is not given to the word and in prayer and not given diligence to those very things, then, then what do you expect from this walk that you call a walk of faith? If, if there's nothing put into it, then how is it that you're expecting something to come out of it? It's as simple as this. And he's saying to the, la to, to the lazy here, uh, in, in regards to them, he says, you know, there is a folly to laziness. There is a danger. And he goes on to say here that, that they live their lives, however, a little, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. And he says, the problem with laziness is, so shall your poverty come upon you like a prowler. It, it comes upon you. Now, we live in a country where, you know, I, I just from my experience, um, you know, you can do very well, you know, business-wise in life. Um, I don't recommend people moving to Southern California, very expensive here, but, but we live in a country of opportunity, as I, I guess I'll put it that way. And, and I say that only because I've traveled the world, I've been to other countries, third world countries, fourth world countries, and I've been to one fifth world country, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. And you know what I find in those countries? The one that is the poorest of all, I've been there uh, about 13 times, and I found that they are the most industrious, diligent, and planning ahead people. Everybody's going somewhere but nobody has anything. And I'll never forget, in speaking to a group of students as I was teaching at the Bible college there, and I says, how is it? I've seen thousands of people in the marketplace, and how is it that everybody has somewhere to go and the infrastructure is so torn down? He says, if you just sit at home all day, and if you just worry about what you don't have, he says, you will die. And I says, what do you mean? He says, you'll die. No more life. Die. That's it. I says, really? He says, really? He says, the reason why people are moving and the reason why they're going in this direction and that direction and there's something going on is because this is what's keeping them going. They're fully aware that their infrastructure is depleted and everything around them is dead. He says, but this fight within them to live simply is put in these dire circumstances, just get up and move. Because if you're up and you're moving, something will happen. And he turned and he looked at me and he says, Pastor David, where do you think that came from? And I said, I don't know. You guys just like to pretend like you're doing stuff. <laughs> <laughs> he 
He says, no, he says, this comes from the Lord. This comes from the Lord. He says, and this is why they need Christ. This is why they need Jesus. This is why we need to evangelize and share the gospel. And, and you know what he says? He says, you know, I did this before I came to the college. I says, really? He says, yeah. He says, for six days, I hadn't eaten nothing. And every day I would get up before the sun would come up and I would go back into this tent before the sun went down. He says, the city where I'm from is actually uh, four hours away, uh, I think, uh, by bus and eight hours away or something like that by vehicle or uh, they call it tap tap, a cab. But he says, he goes, so I couldn't go back home. I says, why did you come here? He says, for, the, for, for, for hope, to go to school, to, to do something good, to find a job. I says, when you came here, he goes, I didn't know nobody, not one person. He says, and so I found myself in a tent city and with no food, no water, nothing, no money, nothing. Not knowing nobody. And he says, the drive to get up every day to look for food. So he says, one day he was praying and he was walking around and he was, didn't know nobody. Everybody's doing the same thing. They're walking, they're moving around. And all of a sudden he says, as he's going, he's just praying and he says, God, you know, you know, I love you. And, 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 and you know that my desire is to be a teacher and my desire is to do a work for you. But, but, but Lord, I need your help. I'm, I haven't eaten in days. And, and he says, all of a sudden in the midst of this sea of, you know, dark people because they're Haitian, there's this white man who just stuck out like a sore thumb. And the white man was staring at him. And he thought, what is this white man doing looking at me? And the white man looked at him and he said, what is he looking for? Because he was walking around looking. And the Lord linked them two up. And the white man is Pastor Brian McDaniel. And he said to this young Haitian named Leo, are you hungry? Leo said, yes. Brian says, can I pray for you? He says, yes. And he says, come on, I'll take you to eat. That was the first student that we opened up the Bible college with. And he became the first pastor that graduated the program and now pastors Calvary Chapel in Capetian in the northern part of the island of Haiti. This idea of survival and getting up. Laziness would have wiped him out Laziness would have consumed him, as a matter of fact. Laziness would have utterly destroyed him, so to speak. Laziness would have did an intended purpose in him that would have been negative, and it would have been detrimental to his soul and to his life. But because he chose not to be lazy, the Lord blesses diligence. So the lazy man, he says, so shall your poverty come and you like a prowler. It'll come upon you like a prowler. Listen to this. And your need like an armed man. Don't be lazy because if you are, you miss out. It'll consume you. He goes on to say in verse 12, he says, don't be wicked. The wicked person. In verse 12, he says, a worthless person, a wicked man, walks with a perverse mouth. Now, a part of this, too, is that a wicked person, uh, a person who has this, this mindset in wickedness, walking in wickedness, being a wicked person, in a sense, is kind of what the Lord highlights throughout Scripture. The idea of a worthless person, kind of like the story of Naboth. Remember that? A man who is wicked, but also in that regard, uh, worthless. In 1 Samuel chapter 25, in verse 25, uh, this idea is referred to in the story here. And the, the picture here really has to do with, with this. What is a worthless person? 1 Samuel chapter 25, let's turn there very quickly. And just kind of consider uh, the story that's at hand here. The Bible says here, in regards to this picture of the story, um, this is not too long after, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the death of Samuel. 
This is the story of, of, of Nabal and the wife of Nabal. Remember that the name Nabal means uh, foolish. Uh, not a good name. Don't name your child Nabal. But this is what the scriptures speak in regards to him. And the Bible says, the story kind of goes that David, um, you know, knew of a businessman in, in the area, in the region of Carmel, and he was very rich, and he had 3,000 sheep and, and 1,000 goats, and, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel, and the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife was Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding, beautiful appearance, but the man was harsh and evil in his doings. He was of the house of Caleb. When David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep, David sent ten young men, and David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel, go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. So greet him in my name. David's name should be good to Nabal. But it also says here that Nabal was a man who was evil and harsh in his dealings. But his wife was a woman of understanding and beautiful. In other words, what the Bible is really saying is that her husband was a jerk. That's what it says. And thus you shall say to him who lives in prosperity, listen to this, in prosperity, peace be to you and peace to your house and peace to all that you have. And this is David speaking a word of peace. This is David speaking this word upon them. And he goes on to say here, now I have heard that you have shearers. Your shepherds were with us and we did not hurt them, nor was there anything missing from them all the while while they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you, Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. Please give whatever comes to your hand to your servants and to your son David. So when David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal according to all these words that David had said in the name of David and waited. Then Nabal answered David's servants, and look at what he said. Who is David? Who is this son of Jesse? There are many servants nowadays who break away, each one from his master. What he means by break away, he means rebel. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my shearers and give it to them when I do not know where they are from? Well, they came in David's name. So David's young men turned to their heels and went back and they came and told all these words. And David said to his men, every man gird on his sword. So every man girded. On his sword. And David also girded on his sword, and about 400 men, and went with David, and 200 stayed with the supplies. Now, when the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Look, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he reviled them. He, in other words, he hurled insults at them. And these men were very good to us. And we were not hurt, nor did we miss anything as long as we accompanied them when we were in the fields. So they were, so they were a wall to us, both by night and day, all the time we were with them, keeping the sheep. Now, therefore, know that and consider what you will do, for harm is determined against our master, her husband, <laughs> and against all his household, for he is such a scoundrel. You know, the word here it means son of Belial. <laughs> it's the same word for worthless person. That's the idea behind it. As a matter of fact, Nabal is called a worthless person. It's also the same term that's used consistently in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 15 in regards to Satan himself. That one cannot speak to him. Then Abigail made haste, took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five sheep already dressed, five sails of restored grain, 100 clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and loaded them on donkeys. And she said to her servants, go on before me, see, I am coming after you. And she said, do not tell her husband Nabal. So it was as she rode on the donkey that she went down under the cover of the hill and there was David and his men coming down toward her and she met them. And David said, surely in vain I have protected all that this fellow has in the wilderness so that nothing was missed of all that belongs to him. And he has repaid me evil for good. 
May God do so and more also to the enemies of David if I leave one male and all who belong to him by morning light. What do you think David was there to do? He was there to wipe them all out. Now Abigail saw David. She dismounted quickly from the donkey, fell on her face before David, bowed down to the ground. So she fell at his feet and said, Oh, are on me. My Lord, on me, let this iniquity be. And please let your maidservant speak in your ears and hear the words of your maidservant. Let not my Lord regard this scoundrel Nabal. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young man of my Lord whom you sent. Now, therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, since the Lord has held you back from coming to bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hand, now let your enemies and those who seek harm for my Lord be as Nabal. And now this present which your maidservant has brought to my Lord, let it be given to the young man who followed my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your maidservant, for the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house, because my Lord fights the battles of the Lord, and evil is not found in you throughout your days. Look at that. My husband is a worthless man, a scoundrel, because he defied the Lord. That's what she recognized. And she says, I refuse to defy the Lord. Because unlike my husband, you're a man who honors the Lord. You're not a worthless man or a wicked man like my husband. You're a man of God. Yet a man has risen to pursue you and seek your life. But the life of my Lord shall be found in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God and the lives of your enemies, he shall sing out, sling out, excuse me, as from the pocket of a sling. And it shall come to pass when the Lord has done for my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and he's appointed you ruler over Israel. Notice what she's saying here. You're called of God. You're blessed of God. I want to bless you. I want to take care of your men. And you know what David did? He received it. The contrast between the wicked person and the worthless person is found in that very same story. But even more so, um, this heart that this woman Abigail had was an amazing heart. Why? Because it was in this that later when her husband did eventually die, because Nabal did die, Abigail was all alone. And guess what the Bible says? When David caught word that Nabal had died, he remembered the kind gesture of Abigail. And guess what he did? The Bible says he went and he married this widow, Abigail, and she became one of the wives of King David. What a beautiful picture. Boy, I don't think she realized what she was getting out of the deal as she went and spared her husband's life. But a worthless person, a wicked man, walks with a perverse mouth. Isn't that what Nabal did? He spoke perverse things, bad things, wicked things against God's anointed, David. The Bible says this type of worthless person in verse 13, he winks with his eyes and he shuffles his feet and he points with his fingers. This is a common practice. Listen, as you see people always trying to manipulate and scheme, you know, they'll kind of look at the person behind them and hey, you know, and that and it's always a conniving tactic, so to speak. He says this is what the wicked man does, always looking to take advantage of the one that he's dealing with, never keeping a commitment or a word, simply all for the purpose of self-gain. Be very careful. They're fast with their words and their hands. You know, a person that can't look you dead in the eyes when they're talking to you and discuss with you and that, you gotta always be, you know, leery of that. Always make sure that, that you got their attention and they have yours. He goes on to say in verse 14, perversity is in his heart and he devises evil continually. And look at what he does. He sows discord. And that's exactly what Nabal was doing. Nabal sowed discord. And what Abigail's desire was, was to restore that which was separated. He says, we were, we were together. As a matter of fact, Nabal's servants said they were like a wall to us by night. They protected us. They kept us in. They hedged us in. He goes on to say here, therefore, his calamity shall come suddenly. 
and suddenly he shall be broken without remedy. So the sin of this strife and discord, of creating conflict, really intentionally, discord is something within the body of Christ. I think oftentimes people cause discord without even realizing it. It doesn't mean that they're going to get away from the consequences of it. No, they will realize it one day. The Lord will show them. No, that was, that was your doing. And from that point, as they come to realize that the discord was brought about by them, they have opportunity to come back and make things right and apologize for the discord they caused. Then there's others who intentionally cause discord for the purpose of, of just disrupting things. Talking about people is the is probably the greatest discord you can create, especially among the body of Christ. Nobody is justified in gossiping. Nobody is justified in talking about someone else or saying something negative about someone just to make themselves look good or as if they have the authority to talk about other people's things. They don't. A discord is something that truly ruins what God brings together. It happens in all types of relationships. It's disunity. It's the enemy to unity, the enemy to oneness, the enemy to togetherness. Therefore, his calamity shall come suddenly. This is something that is dealt with very severely. He goes on to say, these six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look. That's kind of what we're seeing an overview of just verses 12 through 15. Look at that. A proud look. Well, well there it says in verse 13 that he winks with his eyes. He goes on to say a lying tongue. In verse 12, it says he walks with, perverse, with a perverse mouth. Hands that shed innocent blood. Well, his fingers point. For what purpose? For destructiveness. A heart devises wicked plans. Perversity of heart is what we see here in verse 14. He goes on to say this as well. Feet that are swift in running to evil. We see in verse 13, he shuffles his feet. A false witness who speaks lies once again. One who clearly has a perverse mouth and one who sows discord among brethren. Verse 14, he who sows discord. These are things that God hates. Now, now why does God hate these things? I believe this has to do with how God has created us. As we said this morning, these things are contrary to, to what represents God in you and me. When we go back to Genesis 1, the Bible says man's created in the image of God. And, and whether you like it or not, the, that's non-believers included. All humanity is created in God's image. And, and us being the greatest of all of God's creation, because we are the only of his creation created in his image, all these things are contrary to the image of God that we are created in. It's the result of sin. So it's not that God hates the person. He hates the very thing that infiltrates the image of God in his creation, us, you and me. So this is why God hates these things. This is why I'm thankful that God is not only a God of love, but a God of hate who hates sin. The very things that separate us and having fellowship with God, those are the very things that God has a direct attack against. And those who give themselves to these things, as we stated earlier this morning in the message, was the very fact that these people are those that the Bible says are at enmity with God. To practice these things is to say, I have no desire to be associated with the image of God. It's like Esau giving up his birthright. Those who choose to walk this way are giving up their birthright. They are choosing to walk away contrary and to rather than receive the word of God, they receive the word of Satan. Because it was the very word that caused this to begin to take place and the war to begin for the souls of men. 
The words were very simple. Did God really say that? And it started. The image of God was attacked by words contrary to the precious, pure image of his creation. Coming into the years, let me give you guys another good thought. Have you ever noticed in the book of Hebrews, in chapter 10 and verse 5, where it says, For offerings and sacrifices you did not desire, but a body you have prepared. When you look at that from the text that it's taken from, it's taken from the psalm, in Psalm chapter 40, in verses 6 and 8. If you look at this from the Greek Septuagint of the text, it, it says something a little bit different. As a matter of fact, it, it, it doesn't say, for a body you have prepared for me. It says, uh, my ears you have opened. So, so what does this mean? What, why is there a difference in a change from here in the New Testament saying a body you have prepared, but in the Old Testament, in the original text, it says my ears you have opened. It doesn't say that here. Because according to Hebraic teaching, and their understanding is that their idea is that man would be created from the ears first because faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God. Everything that man is created of comes from this part and then he's created outward. Just an idea or a thought they have. This is kind of how they hold this thing. So it's important to what goes into man's ear. And this is why there's so much in regards to hearing the word of the Lord and not only hearing the word of God, but heeding the word of God, taking it into your heart because they believe that it's through the word of God the word, Debar, that has weight. The word of the Lord. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 19, in verses 7, 8, and 9, it says, the word of God is perfect. Perfection is found in partaking and receiving of the word of God. Man takes it in through his earring. It settles in his heart. And it becomes the focus, the purpose, the plan. As a matter of fact, it becomes these three activities how one roams, how one sleeps, and how one awakes. And this is what the psalmist begins to say as he gives the warning. And that's for next week's study. But here's the point. It's an attack on God's image in us. So sometimes when we say the war is so great, the warfare is far beyond your ability to even understand because truly everything contrary to what God is, the war is in you and me. The Lord says he hates these things because that's not the image of God. These are not the practices of the Lord. And so when these things consume our lives and we begin to live this way, listen, you look at the whole contrast between the story of Nabal and David. And look at how each one responded, Nabal and Abigail. Who represented the image of God more? Abigail, Nabal didn't. What was his ultimate end? Well, he almost got taken out early. He's getting taken out anyways. But ultimately we see that when we choose to be bearers of the image of God, according to the scriptures, there's blessings that follow. Boy, was her life blessed. All because she said, this is not right. You are called of God. You're a man of God. And all I want to do is honor God. And if this is the opportunity that I have to honor the Lord by thanking you for what you've done, to God be the glory is really what her praise was before David and before the Lord. And she knew, kind of like what Paul says, wives, submit unto your husbands as unto the Lord. Abigail got it. She did it. David probably thought, what a good woman to be married to. As soon as she became widowed, he married her. And you know that that was a good choice for David. Amen? But look at this picture here. I'd rather do what God loves than practice what God hates. My prayer and my conviction would be, Lord, guard my heart from practicing the things or even treading lightly upon those things that you hate. May my life never be an abomination to you. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to you're going to knock it out the park every time. But if there is conviction, you'll go a long way. And how does this conviction come? Well, we'll start just here, but we're going to close with this. It says, my son, keep your father's command. Do not forsake the law of your mother. Bind them continually upon your heart. And why does it say the law of your mother? 
Look at this. Here's why. Deuteronomy chapter 6. It says, now this is the commandment and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you, you and your son and your grandson in all the days of your life that your days may be prolonged. Therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it that it may be well with you that you may multiply, multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as fontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Well, when the dads are out to work and if they're part of the army of Israel, when they're out to war, who do you think is teaching these children at home? Mom. And this is what he's saying here. This is the perfect picture of a Hebrew family and he's saying this, He's saying, do not forsake the law of your mother, the instruction, the word of God that she gave you. Do not forsake it. Bind them continually upon your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you roam, they will lead you. When you sleep, they will keep you. When you awake, they will speak with you. I love that. Keep it. Don't disregard it. The wisdom of the word provides direction. These circumstances of life, when you go about your day, when you lay down at night, when you wake up in the morning, bind this very word. Some would say, how can I do what God loves? Stay close to the word and you'll do well. The moment you stray and you heed these words, did God really say that? It all goes bad. You begin to practice what he hates rather than do what he loves. What does God honor the most? Obedience, doesn't he? He honors that the most in our life, obedience. You want to give him the greatest honor? Just do what the word says. So beware. Don't be the surety or the guarantee of another's debt. And if you do, try to get out of it as quickly as you can. Don't be lazy. Because poverty will come upon you like a prowler and your need like an armed man. And that could even happen in the, what is it, the American dream, the land of the American dream. Trust me, it can happen anywhere. And don't be a worthless person, a wicked man who walks with a perverse mouth, who winks with his eyes, who shuffles with his feet, points with his finger. Perversity is in his heart, devises evil continually, and sows discord. If you do, then you will become a practicer of the very things that God hates. But rather... Do not forsake the law of your mother. Bind them continually upon your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you roam, they will lead you. When you sleep, they will keep you. When you awake, they will speak with you. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you.